morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Thank you. Please be seated, please. Thank you. Thank you. What an extravagant introduction. I wish my wife had been here to hear that. Well, he said I'm a general. That's a euphemism for old. But uh, it's great to be here, wonderful to be a part of this great church and each of the services this morning and at the churches elsewhere at Middle River, we greet you, Rising Sun. The sun is coming up at Rising Sun. And in Nairobi, I know you speak Swahili, so Jambo Nairobi, Buanasi Fiwe, Mungu Akubariki. So we thank God, and for those of you that speak English, good morning. If you have your Bibles, if you'll take those and turn, if you will, to the second chapter of Acts. In just a moment, I'll begin reading there. There are, as they uh, noted, some uh, books at the product table that are in the lobby. I hope that you will stop by there and buy many of them. Um, But I want to just point out one to you that has just exploded for us. I'm very grateful. This is a book called David the Great. It's the life and leadership of King David. It's, It's just been a a tremendous seller for us, and I hope you'll buy it. One reason is because it has engaged male readers. Uh, Christian books in general are bought and read by women. But regardless of what some of you girls think, some men can read. And (laughs) we started to put pictures in this one. We thought that would help. (laughs) But but David was a man's man. He He was a tough guy, a warrior's warrior. And, uh, and I, I think that the men would love this. I know you ladies will enjoy it as well, but make sure that the men in your life get it and read it. Uh, one lady brought, bought uh, 10 cases. There's 36 in a case. I said, ma'am, I'll sell you a thousand. Why are, she said, my son is a master sergeant in the army and I'm sending 360 books for him to hand out to soldiers. So isn't that great? Another guy bought a... Uh, uh, a copy for all the police in his city police force. I like, I like to know the cops are reading Christian books. Amen. I was working on this book, a manuscript in Israel. I've been to Israel 49 times and I was there at a picnic table by the Sea of Galilee editing the manuscript. An Israeli woman walked up and she said, uh, are you an American? I said, I am. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm a- editing a book. She said, what about? I said, David, I'm in Israel speaking to an Israeli woman. I said, David. She said, David who? I said, King David, the king of Israel. She got a horrible look on her face and she stepped back like I touched her with a cattle prod. And she said, why would you write a book about that bloody man? And she stormed off. And I thought to myself, what a man. I mean, que hombre, what a man. 3,000 years after his death, he can still make a woman that angry. (laughs) So I hope you'll get this book and all the others. There's one out there called uh, Of Kings and Prophets. There's, There's several books that are there, and I hope you'll enjoy them all. It probably doesn't matter to you to hear it, but it matters to me to say it. I do not take one penny. I never have. There's no smoke and mirrors. I don't take one penny from any book we've ever sold. Hundreds of thousands of copies of our books, 19 books have been sold worldwide and it all goes 100%. All the profit goes to support our girls' homes in West Africa and Thailand. So I hope you'll go out there to the book table. Go out there to the book table and spend yourself into bankruptcy. Forget about Dave Ramsey. (laughs) Refinance your house. (laughs) Take the children's lunch money. Come on. (laughs) Well, you're a jolly crew. I see now what we've got. This is the eight o'clock service on caffeine. (laughs) (laughs) If you have your Bibles, if you'll take those and turn, if you will, to the book of Acts, the second chapter, you've already heard an extended narration of the, of the second chapter of Acts, the greater passages, at least a, a summary, uh, uh, edited version of some of the passages. I want to just read the first four verses. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, 
They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Put your hands on your Bible, if you will, and let's pray together. Padre bendito celestial, te damos gracias por tu presencia con nosotros en esta mañana, porque te necesitamos mucho. Gracias por tu gracia. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your peace and your love, and I pray that you will overwhelm every barrier to divine communication, linguistic, generational, national, that the Holy Spirit will have free reign. We believe you for it in the mighty name Jesus, the strong Son of God. Amen. Amen, amen and amen. It is not possible to explain what happened in any given historical event in terms of any or all of the things that happened. In other words, what happens is not necessarily the sum of all the stuff that happens. Now that I've got you confused, let me show you what I mean. Suppose Pastor and I go over to see a football game here, and uh, as we're leaving the stadium a bit early, we're met in the parking lot by somebody from some godforsaken foreign country, Michigan or something, and... (laughs) And he says, I saw the lights and heard the yelling and everything. What was going on in there? We said, well, this is American football. And he says, well, what happened in there? What what was it about? And I say, well, what happened is there are five men with build caps and striped shirts. They have whistles around their necks and a yellow flag in their back pocket. And they run up and down on a field that's defined as 50 yards by 100 yards. And when they are overwhelmed by sheer women vagary, they blow the whistle and throw the flag in the air. If you want to really understand football, by your whistle and a yellow flag, run up and down in your front yard. And when you're overwhelmed by the fancy, just throw the flag in the air and blow the whistle and you'll have football. Now that happened, didn't it? But you can't explain football in terms of the the back judge and the line judge and the, the referees. Pastor, on the other hand, he stares at me in stark amazement. And he says, that's not what happened. There were 12 beautiful young girls jumping up and down. We'll not pursue that any further, but irrespective of what the Dallas Cowboys would have us think, You cannot explain football in terms of the cheerleaders. Certainly, there are cheerleaders. Certainly, there's a PA announcer. Certainly, there is referees. But all of them combined cannot explain the nature of the contest. The same thing is true of Pentecost. Imagine trying to explain what happens in the second chapter of Acts only in terms of the concomitant realities that happen in the room. There's a lot of stuff that happened. I'm not going to guarantee to you that they'll happen in here today. On the other hand, (laughs) I'm not going to guarantee you they won't. Now, what did happen? So what happened is that there are 120 Jewish people who have gathered to celebrate the, the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost is not just a New Testament word. It's not a Christian word. See, it's a Greek translation of a Hebrew word, a Hebrew phrase, In the Hebrew Bible, the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot, is about seven weeks plus the day of the plus the day of um, of the celebration itself. So seven times seven is forty nine plus one is fifty. So when in the when the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek for the Septuagint, they had to find a Greek word for Shavuot. So they took fifty every Greek word that has the prefix of Penta means some variation of five. So a pentagram, uh, the the Pentagon, the five-sided building in Washington, D.C. that's filled with confusion. And then then you have a pentathlete. He's an athlete or she is an athlete that competes in, in five events. So the Pentecost is a derivative of 50, 50 weeks from Passover to Shavuot. That's that's what it means. These 120 Jews have gathered there 
50 days after the crucifixion of Christ, they are gathered to celebrate the Jewish feast of Shavuot, of Pentecost, which they have their whole lives, and their ancestors did, and their ancestors' ancestors, all the way back to Moses. I do not believe for one moment that they knew what was about to happen. We, we have the book of Acts. They didn't. They hadn't read the second chapter. I don't believe they got up that morning and said, second chapter of Acts. <laughs> Five minutes to nine. This all happened at nine o'clock in the morning. I don't think Simon Peter's saying to himself, Five minutes, the Holy Ghost is coming. They are simply there to celebrate the feast, the Jewish feast of Pentecost. When suddenly, through the room, there is the sound of a tornado. Imagine. If right now the sound of a tornado ripped through this room, not a hair on your head ruffled by a breeze, the sound, it sounds like a locomotive if you've ever heard a tornado, just roars through the room. Wouldn't that be exciting? Might scare the liver out of you, but wouldn't it be exciting? No sooner does that room disappear than right up in the top of the room, the boiling cloud of the presence, the Shekinah glory, and it whirls off. And tongues of visible, physical fire come to rest over every head. You say to yourself, no, thank you. I'm visiting. Doesn't matter. You get one. You're here. (laughs) No sooner does that disappear than you find yourself standing to proclaim the glories of God in both the tongues of men and of angels. In the subsequent chapter, there are some 13 human languages that are mentioned there. And the people in that room spoke none of them naturally. So they are speaking these languages and, in, and speaking in tongues in that room. And imagine if that all happened in this room. You know what would happen? What would happen is what happened right there. Soon, thousands and thousands of people, you wouldn't be able to park the cars. Word of this would get through Baltimore and there would be people forever pile up here. And as you leave, someone says to you, What happened in there? Be careful how you answer. If you answer in terms of the stuff that happened, you may misguide them about what happened. What happened in there? Oh, you say, it was the sound of wind in the room. And they say, oh, it was just a political convention. (laughs) Or you say, fire, tongues of fire. It was so exciting. And their curiosity might be stirred, but would their conscience be touched? Or you might say, I stood up and preached in a language I didn't even know. And they might say to you, that was fine for you, but no thanks. Trust me, they might very well say that. All of those things happened, but they are not what happened at Pentecost. So what we want to ask ourselves on Pentecost Sunday, what happened in the upper room. If we can understand that, maybe we can understand what God wants to do in us this very morning. So the first thing that happened is that something came to be on planet earth that had never been before. The living, breathing, corporate body of Christ. The church was born at Pentecost. Up until that moment, There had been individual believers who trusted in Christ as Messiah, but they did. There was no church specifically. So the church is born at Pentecost. We dare not back away from Pentecost when we become embarrassed or resistant to the supernatural power of Pentecost and back away. The further away from the fire of Pentecost we get, the colder the church grows. We may do good things. Sponsor little league teams and and care for the poor, but then we become nothing but a glorified Kiwanis club, redefining ourselves in terms of our own agenda. The church was born at Pentecost. We cannot be embarrassed by the power of Pentecost. When we celebrate now the Christian reality of this ancient Jewish feast, we are celebrating the birth of the church. The second thing that happened was that the theater of operation for the church, the area, the the realm of life in which we are to operate is defined. From the first moment 
The church is clearly defined and announced to operate in the, in the realm of the supernatural. One of the challenges of a church like, say, the church in the United States is that culturally, or we, we grow in sophistication in our buildings and our cameras and the, the things that we can do, we can begin to find stuff that we rely on other than the supernatural power of God. The church, the 120 people in the upper room were the worldwide church. That's the church. And those 120 people had none of the things that we have. So God said to them from the very beginning, the realm in which you will minister is the realm of the supernatural. Signs and wonders and miracles, the gifts of the spirit, the, the flowing power of the supernatural. This is the realm in which we are to live. The natural, supernatural habitat of the church is the realm of the supernatural. Now that doesn't mean that we can dictate to God. It doesn't mean that every prayer you pray, the minute you pray it, God's going to dance to your tune. It means that that's the realm in which we are to live. I talked to the lady one time. She wanted me to go hear a certain preacher and preach. And I said, why should I go? She said, he has announced that every person he prays for gets healed. Now listen to me, brethren. Anybody that says every person they pray for gets healed, immediately put your hand over your wallet and put your arm around your wife. Because the fact of the matter is, we are who we are in the limitations of our own natural self, and therefore we operate in the supernatural by His grace and His power, but we don't run this thing. God is the God of the church. But that's, that's a corporate thing. That's an us thing. And they, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. What happened in those people? What happened in them? 50 days earlier, they have seen, only 50 days, think about this. They have seen Jesus crucified in naked humiliation in front of the city of Jerusalem. They have seen him die seen his dead body deposited in a tomb and on the third day raised from the dead. And it says for the next 40 days, he speaks with them, walks with them and teaches them about things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So 40 days they have been with the, the living resurrected Christ. Can, can you imagine what that must have felt like? Can we dilate our imagination to the place where we can imagine sitting across the breakfast table with somebody that you saw die? They just raised from the dead. And when he picks his fork up, he's holding it with hands that have the nail scars still visible. I mean, wow. And at the end of 40 days, he takes them over to the Mount of Olives across from the temple. And he says, now. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Think 120 people who have never, never been out of Israel, never been any further from Jerusalem than Galilee. And he says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. They don't even know what that means, all the world. And preach the gospel to every creature. And those that believe shall be saved and those that believe not shall be damned. In other words, the effectiveness with which you proclaim the gospel will determine people's eternal disposition. Think of that responsibility. And he says, by the way, I'm leaving. The sky opens. Jesus rises to the right hand of God. The sky closes behind him and they stand there. Wouldn't you? It's the most natural thing. And it says two angels come and say, why stand ye here gazing into heaven? Of course, we don't know the backstory of that, but I think I do. I think God looked down and said, look at them. If it rains, they're going to drown. <laughs> he says to two angels, you guys go down there. And they go say, why stand ye here gazing into heaven? Go back into Jerusalem. Wait for the promise of the father. Wait till you receive. Only these few days later, later, on the day of Pentecost, they've been praying and praying and praying. The Bible doesn't tell us 
what they prayed. But I know, don't you? Go into all the world and preach the gospel? God, I can't. I don't have any power. I can't do this. I don't know how to go anywhere. I've never been anywhere. I can't do this. I've got to have something I don't have. I've got to receive something I haven't received. On the day of Pentecost, God answers their prayer and the church is baptized in power. But what about the people? What about the people in the room? What happens to them? Take Simon Peter, for example. Simon Peter, the the narrator that during the video, Simon Peter says, you men of Jerusalem and all you that hear my voice. And he preaches with power. This same Christ whom you crucified, God hath raised from the dead and testified that he is the son. Great power and effectiveness. What in the world? Simon Peter? 50 days earlier, he denied Jesus three times before the sun came up. Craven, gutless little coward. Hid under his bed. He didn't even see Jesus crucified. He went home and wept in his room. John went to the cross. If I had been God on the day of Pentecost, I would have said to Simon Peter, okay, you can receive the Holy Spirit, but keep your mouth shut. (laughs) Sit over there on the back row. John, you preach. My mother's at your house. But not not Jesus. Why is Simon Peter used to preach the Pentecostal message? Because he is living personal proof of the transformational and empowering grace of God in an individual life. There is a great thing in attending a church like this, a spirit-filled church with great worship and great preaching. And that's a wonderful blessing. But there's a risk. The risk is that you can identify, misidentify one, not you. One can misidentify one's personal experience with the prevailing atmosphere. In other words, we see how this feels in here and we think that has something to do with who I am. When I was in seminary in graduate school, right at the end of the Civil War, I remember, (laughs) it's rude to laugh at a guest speaker. I worked for a season in the, in the university library and people would mention a book. Have you read Karl Barth's Dogmatics? Oh, yes. What about Demythologization of the New Testament by Rudolf Bultmann? Oh, yeah, I read that. And I realized I was lying. I hadn't read those books. It wasn't intentional. It was spontaneous. Why would I do that? Because the books were so familiar to me. I looked them up, checked them in, checked them out, repaired them. And they were so much, I handled them so much. I thought they were part of the outside of my life. I thought they were part of the inside. That can happen in a spirit-filled church. It can happen to a preacher. When I, uh, when I felt called to preach, I'd grown up in a very shallow water Methodist home, uh, very four or five Sundays a year go to church. I felt called to preach. I finished at the University of Maryland. I went to Atlanta to take my Master's of Divinity at, em- at Emory. I wanted to do it right. I wanted to be a Methodist preacher. I wasn't some crazy liberal or something. I just wanted to do it right. I tried to learn everything, do everything they told me to do. I, I-, I preached for seven years wearing a full-length black Geneva gown. I look, I look like a buzzard with a gland problem. I, I, the skull and the pyramid and everything, candle lighting, training the acolytes. I did the whole deal. I wanted to do it right. At the end of seven years, seven years, I realized I had nothing to show for it. Seven years of a dead man preaching dead sermons to dead congregations. I know that you think the most horrible thing in the world is listening to a dead, unanointed message. It's not. That's not the worst thing in the world. Preach one. That's the worst thing in the world. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Realizing that as Shakespeare said, your sermons are just words, words, words. The end of seven years, deeply depressed. Our marriage in in anger All my depression was manifested in anger. We were, now we've been married 56 years. But at that time, 
I know your applause are for my wife. And <laughs> but at that time, our marriage was hanging by a thread. We were both just waiting for the other one to say divorce. With anger, anger at home, difficulty and fruitlessness. Seven years and nothing to show for it. Well, we had a really good softball team. We, every year in the tournament, we just beat the Baptist like a two-year-old at a Walmart. We just <laughs> cleaned them up. But that, is that enough? Is that it? I, I, I felt empty, deeply depressed, borderline suicidal, and, and nothing to show for it. At the end of seven years, I was invited frankly forced to attend a conference for Methodist ministers. Nobody, no layman could attend. It was just Methodist preachers. It was called the Conference on Power for Ministry Today. And it advertised that it would explain to us the charismatic renewal movement. It was sweeping through the Methodist church at that time like a tidal wave. And we didn't know what to do with these charismatics. I had charismatics in my church like termites. And I didn't know what to do. I tried to run them off. And when I left <laughs> and it came into Pentecost, they were all waiting for me. Oh, Dr. Rutland, you've arrived. <laughs> so we went to this conference. I went to this conference, all of these 120 Methodist preachers, to try to understand what the charismatic movement was. What we didn't count on is this. When you begin to study the Holy Spirit, he may begin to study you. We had a guest speaker, Dr. Ralph Wilkerson, the late Ralph Wilkerson from Melody Land Christian Center in Anaheim, California. This guy freaked me out. In the first place, he named his church Melody Land. No, you cannot do that. <laughs> There's no such thing as Melody Land Methodist Church. You can have First Methodist or Calvary Methodist, but Melody Land, just Melody Land Church. In the second place, he had on white shoes in December. Now, you, you can't wear white shoes after Labor Day. So I sat in judgment on him. I was in the back row with my arms crossed, judging him. And he opened his Bible and preached. He preached for about 20 minutes. And he did not say one thing that I could say was wrong. I, I understood. I had a theological, theoretical view of the Holy Spirit. I've got a four credit A in pneumatology at the graduate level. I, I, I understood the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. So I was ready for him to say some error, some, some terrible thing. He didn't say one thing I disagreed with. And then he said, that's all theology. He said, now here's the question. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? He said, is Pentecost just in your Bible or is it in your heart? He said, I'm not asking if you're a preacher. I'm asking, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And the answer came up inside of me. If this is real, I haven't received it. I began to weep. I couldn't stop. Ralph Wilkerson, white shoes and all, left the platform came out to me where I was, knelt down beside me and put his arm around me and he said, Pastor, don't you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I opened my mouth to say no. No, I don't believe in that. I don't want that. There's no such thing as a second work of grace. I don't want it. No. And I heard my own mouth say, oh yes, please, please help me. And I realized for once in my life, my spirit and not my intellect had cried out. He said, all right, I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. And he did. Father, I give you my life. Everything I am, everything I have, my ministry, my marriage, my reputation, everything. I give it all to you. I prayed the prayers he told me to. And then he said, now I'm going to lay my hands on you. And then I flinched. I had been taught in seminary. This is true. I had been taught that Pentecostal evangelists carried hidden buzzers in the palm of their hand. And that when people came forward, they would talk, put that buzzer on them and they'd fall down. And he said, I'm gonna lay, I'm gonna lay my hands on you. So oh God, he's gonna buzz me. I know, he's, I know he's gonna buzz me now. And I just flinched. He just reached over and placed his fingertips on my head and he said, okay, son, 
In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, receive the Holy Spirit. I don't know what happened in 119 other Methodist preachers. I don't give anybody else's testimony. I can only tell you that at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on December the 5th, 1975, a sad, defeated, demonized, and suicidal Methodist preacher, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God poured into me. His transforming grace, His transforming grace just poured into my life. Now I know what somebody here is saying to themselves. Yes, but what if I ask God to fill me this morning? What if I, sitting here, that's fine for this Methodist preacher 1975, but what about me this morning? What if I ask God to fill me with the Holy Spirit this morning? What will happen to me? What will it feel like? What will be the sensation of it? I don't have a clue. No, I don't know. I mean, see, that's the thing. This is a high risk prayer. You write Jesus a blank check. You say, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. I don't care how you do it, but fill me with the Holy Spirit. You can't say, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit, but none of that. You, you, don't, get to, you don't get to arrange this. By the same token, you also don't get to say, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit, but it has to feel that way. You write Jesus a blank check. I've seen people, when I receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, all that fear and loneliness and depression, it just poured out of me in tears. I, I wept like Niobe following after her children. I couldn't stop, I just wept. My wife, Two weeks later, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And she just bowed her sweet little head and said, oh, at last. Thank you. Thank you. I remember the first time I ever saw anybody laugh. It so offended me. I was at First Methodist Church in Douglasville, Georgia, and a little old lady came to the altar. You know the communion rail in a Methodist church. She came over there and she said she wanted the Holy Spirit. She had a little pinched face. I said, you want to receive the Holy Spirit? She said, yes. I put my hand on her little gray head and I said, woman, in the name of Jesus, receive the Holy Spirit. And she put her head back and her hands up and began to laugh. She just laughed and I was so offended. I said, Lord, that silly old woman, she should weep. I wept, she should weep. Just laughing. I said, look at that. And Jesus said, what's the matter with you? That woman has lived like a clenched fist for 60 years. And I've just given her the joy of the Holy Spirit. I I looked over at her and it looked like Jesus was kneeling down beside of her. And it looked like he was laughing. And it looked like he was laughing at me. I remember the first time I ever saw anybody fall down. It stunned me. I'd gone to preach in a little tiny Pentecostal church in the mountains of Mexico. And a lady came forward for the baptism. I mean, this lady was la gorda mucha. I mean, she was big. (laughs) And I reached up and touched her forehead with three fingers. And she fell backward from her heels like a domino onto a bare concrete floor. Her head just bounced like a basketball. And I'd never seen anything like it. And it scared me. I thought she had come forward with hidden sin in her life and God had killed her. I just, I was shook. Literally, I went up on the platform and just knelt down. And the little Pentecostal evangelist came over and knelt down by this Methodist preacher. And he said, that really bothered you, didn't it? I said, yes. And he said, son, it just, she was slain in the spirit. I said, oh God, I thought so. I mean, slain in the spirit's a very militant turn of phrase. I didn't even know he was armed. (laughs) I've seen people weep. I've seen people speak in tongues. I've seen people thank God. I've seen people just lift their hands up and say, praise. Here's the thing. You don't run this. See, the thing with God is he's like, see, God and all. He gets to be God. He gets to do your experience and everybody else's his way. 
The issue is, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? That's the question. What about you? Not us, not here, not this building. What about you? Will you bow your heads and close your eyes all over the house? Heavenly Father, I thank you for these people who have gathered in their numbers, seeking help from you, grace from you, and power from you. Now with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you would say, Dr. Rutland, will you pray for me? I want to receive the Holy Spirit. I want Pentecost to be mine, not in the Bible. I want a personal Pentecost. The high school student says, how do I witness effectively in a school full of heathen? The, the retired businessman, how do I live the rest of my life in joy and effectiveness? The career girl, how do, I, how do I live for Christ in the business world? Jesus says, have you received my spirit? If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit this morning, you say, I want Pentecost for me personally. Then you lift your hand where you are. Say, right, I'm going to pray with you right where you sit. If you say that, I need that. Yes, hold your hand up high. So many, so many. Yes. Oh, yes. From the literally from the back row to the front row, literally so many, so many, so many. Now I'm going to lead you in a prayer and I want you to pray it out loud with me. Not loudly, but pray it out loud. Open your mouth and pray with me as I lead you. Say, Heavenly Father, I give you my life. Say, it, I give you my life. Everything I am. All that I have from this moment on. As never before, Jesus is the Lord of my life. And I'm asking you in his name, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Make Pentecost mine. And I believe you for it. All right, are you ready? Bow your head and close your eyes. All right, friend. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in the authority of that name, receive the Holy Spirit. Be filled from the top of your head to the sole of your feet. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. He's filling you right now. Receive the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now begin to praise Him. Open your mouth and praise Him. Thank you, God. Praise Him in English. Praise Him in Swahili. Praise Him in Spanish. Praise Him in tongues. Praise Him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you. God, thank you. Thank you. Don't even worry about how it sounds. Open your mouth and begin to bless the Lord. Praise you, God. Praise you, God. We worship you. We bless you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you for filling me. Thank you for filling us. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Praise your holy name. Now look right up here. Look up here for just a moment. Listen to me. Write this date down. Put it in the front of your Bible. Write the date, write the time, and put it underneath it. Baptized in the Holy Spirit. Because Satan is a liar and he's the father of lies. And he'll come to you, he'll come to you. He may be speaking to you right now, saying something may have happened to everybody else in that room, but nothing happened to you. And you open your Bible and you say, there it is. There it is right there. It's written in my Bible. Claim it, speak it, own it, and live it. Pentecost is yours. God bless you and God bless this great church.